Uh, good morning, uh, honorable members of the panel. Uh, I will uh, first read a small kind of a note that I have prepared. Uh, good morning to all of you. And I would take this opportunity first to thank the organizers of this event, the Free Press Unlimited, uh, uh, the Reporters Without Borders, and the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, for taking Sri Lanka as one of the countries that needs to be investigated for the crimes committed against journalists. And my name is Bashan Abhivadhan, and I am here as the coordinator of the Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka, an organization widely known as JDS. Uh, we are an exiled group of journalists, writers, and human rights defenders who were forced into exile within the last 15 years. Uh, as I'm testifying before you, Sri Lanka, where I was born, is burning. As mass anger rages across the island, tens of thousands of people have taken to the streets as a response to an unprecedented economic crisis and repressive measures. The shortage of food and medicine have been the most pressing issues. The military is manning the roads as personal armed carriers roll through the streets of Colombo, just like it has always been for the Tamil people living in the island, at least for the last 60 to 70 years, who have been forced to live under the military boot of the ethnocratic state. As I speak on behalf of the organization which I have been working for the last 13 years, I think of every man and every woman who have raised their voices facing the wrath of the repressive government that rules the land I was born. The courage, the resilience, the dedication showed by the people in thousands bring me hope and strength to stand here and speak about the bloodstained history of my birthland. And let me explain about myself a bit, honorable members of the panel. Uh, I'm a Sinhalese by ethnicity and I'm a journalist by profession. I entered journalism in December 1991, soon after leaving my high school, and started working as a trainee journalist in one of the mainstream single weekly newspapers published in Colombo. Uh, my career started in the context of a massive repression that witnessed state brutality unleashed on my generation, who stood against the endless repression of an unpopular government. Over 60,000 young men and women in the south of the island were slaughtered and burned on the roads, including my teenage friends and relatives, and many other known people. My journalist career started one year after the killing of leading journalist Richard de Souza, who was working for Interpress Service at the time of his abduction and assassination by state-organized death squads. Uh, even at the time, journalism was a career that earned all the risks and dangers if he or she wanted to speak the truth. In 1993, I, along with my, all my colleagues in the editorial of the newspaper we worked, resigned in protest of the intervention made by the owners of the newspaper company who wanted to dictate what we write. The same year, we started a weekly newspaper on our own after a four month long intense public fundraising campaign. It was a newspaper owned by journalists and managed by journalists. Apart from my editorial contributions made as a sub editor, and much later as the editor of the paper, I regularly contributed to other newspapers and periodicals until the moment I fled into self-exile at the end of year 2006. The articles and regular columns I have been writing mainly involved matters related to the war and human rights violations, especially after the renewed hostilities between the government and the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. But the killing of Lasanta changed the landscape for the journalists in the South. But for the Tamil journalists who are doing their job in the North and the East, it has always been a nightmare, which I will elaborate later uh, as a response to the questions. This is basically a brief introduction about myself and my profession. Thank you. Um, and I think you touch on what it will be my next question. And it is, I mean, it's, it's the, the circumstances of having to do the journalist the war, uh, work throughout a war. So I just wanted to see if you can describe a little bit, and then it has been clear from the prior testimony that the situation in the north and the northeast was very different than the south. How that was lived by journalists, and what were the situation to, to your knowledge of the Tamil 
or the, or the persecution of Tamil journalists in particular? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, let me uh, quote apart from the statement I have already made, which deals with the, the question directly. Uh, the period uh, started from April 2004 opened the doors for an entire different period of terror. It all started by the killing of a Tamil journalist from the eastern part of the island, Mr. Ayatuddin Adesan, who was shot to death in May 2004. Since then, until the disappearance of Prageet Neknaligoda, whose wife, Sandhya, is also here, and I take it as a kind of uh, uh, it's an emotional moment for me because it's the first time I meet uh, Sandhya. And uh, to see her like this, uh, it makes me really sad. And also, I, uh, she brings quite a lot of strength uh, to most of the people in Sri Lanka who are on the streets now. And until the disappearance of Prageet Technologi in January 2010, at least 44 journalists and media workers have been killed or disappeared. And to response, I mean, as a response to your question, let me tell, I mean, tell, let me take a breakdown of these numbers. And out of these 44, at least 38 journalists and media workers were either killed or made to disappear by the Sri Lankan government. And out of that 38, 35 remain ethnic Tamils, which shows the ethnic dimension of the state perpetrated crimes against media. And having quoted the numbers, it clearly explains the crimes against uh, journalists that have been committed for the last 10, 15, or 20 years cannot be separated from the crimes committed against the Tamil people in the country. And if a Sinhalese journalist was targeted and killed or abducted, that has always to do something with this position or her position towards the Tamil question and the war. So there's a underlying, uh, underlying, uh, real, um, underlying truth about the uh, persecution against journalists in the country as always, to do something with their positions they take towards the rights of the Tamil people, and now the rights of the Muslim people as well. And in your opinion, and through your knowledge, how does such repression uh, has changed or affected the, the, the job of the journalist itself, whether it's investigation or the way they are reporting about things? Well, I think uh, one of the main things in a country like Sri Lanka, where a repressive government governs, uh, what they do as a first uh, step is to close the democratic space where the free press existing or functioning. And by doing so, they basically redesign and reformulate the rules of engagement. And the journalists are given a choice either to play by the rules and live or violate the rules and die. So these are the two options that is always uh, uh, existing in the country for the last 15, 20 years, even more than that, actually. So uh, the problem is actually when uh, journalists are given to deal with certain issues, they will, be, they will have a liberty to deal with certain issues. But there are systemic issues, structural issues that they can't speak about. And the best example is the last 15 years one of the dominating kind of topics that dominated about Sri Lanka was the war crimes that was committed by the Sri Lankan state. But you can't find many articles in the Sri Lankan press about these crimes, because that is where they have drawn the rule. And they have drawn the line, basically, making sure that the journalists can deal with petty corruption and other, uh, mis I mean, like, uh, uh, other problems with the government, other problems with the government, but as long as they don't touch the uh, structural issues, which is actually the criminality of the state, they can function. So in the current situation, still the journalists are not able to discuss the crimes committed against the Tamil people and the crimes being committed against the Muslims, because it, dis it involves not simply the government, but the state itself, and which has been the case uh, for the JDS, the reason that a regime change, a simple regime change would not allow us to go back is because everything that we did so far has been identified as uh, work against the state. So more than anti rajapaksha or anti-government, we have been seen as anti-state. And therefore, our ability to work as journalists inside the country is still decisively curtailed. In 
in your opinion, this self-censorship, it's encouraged by uh, big media outlets, by the journalists. Is this something that one applies to itself, or this is really something encouraging all the different outlets in, in newspapers and the like? Uh, it's a complicated, uh, I have a complicated answer. Actually, la I mean, the thing is, there's a large kind of uh, willingness among the journalists to go with the official narrative when it comes to state crimes, as long as the victims are non singhalese And if the victims are Sinhalese, it's a different matter, who are from the ethnic, the majority ethnic community. So the journalists, the, the small minority of journalists who want to deal with such issues, take, I mean, do that, taking enormous risks. Uh, so I would say the reason that these issues not being dealt in the mainstream media is largely because there's no will. There's a clear lack of will to in, uh, uh, challenge the official narrative and the triumphalist uh, narrative of the war victory. And if somebody is uh, willing to challenge it, he or she would definitely know what the what price come with it actually. So the, the, what you see, the absence of these issues on media was largely decided more than by the owners, by the journalists themselves, actually. How I understand that you've been doing, despite of these, um, that these threats, and you are an investigative journalist and you are from the Sinhalese majority, how do you conduct uh, this currently, uh, under the current circumstances, this work, or even in, in the last few months? Uh, one thing is actually, since, I mean, the JDS is, uh, there are single journalists as well as Tamil journalists, and if you compare the numbers of uh, journalists who were forced into exile, uh, the number of single journalists are actually less than the number of Tamil journalists. But the ability for the Tamil journalists to continue their work due to various issues is quite limited. So the active journalists who are working, Tamil journalists who are working with the JDS at the moment, uh, are uh, trying to bring out the information from the Tamil society. But when it comes to the last couple of months, the fact that we are coming from the majority community still gives us, gives us a kind of a, a advantage of getting information from the ground. And for example, the, uh, one of the best uh, instances was the fact that we were able to bring out all these war crime evidence because the JDS was instrumental in bringing out the very first video evidence of the war crimes that was committed by the state armed forces against the Tamil people in the final stages of the war. And this is because this came from the military. And the military is 99% are from the, uh, made out of the Sinhalese. And they are connected to the larger society of the Sinhalese. And therefore, it's always we have avenues uh, to get such evidence because uh, our contacts on the ground are quite intact and they come from the single society who managed to get this uh, information and to pass it, uh, pass it on to us basically because there's no way they could expose these crimes or expose the events that are happening on the ground uh, in the way that we can do because we have a more kind of uh, free environment to do that without fearing the repercussions. And having said that, I would like to point out one thing. Even when it comes to working in exile, it's not a kind of always uh, a safe kind of uh, job. Because uh, I remember my, from my personal experience in 2009, uh, I was, I, I'm living in Berlin, and I got a letter from the German police uh, telling that there has been a complaint made against me, uh, that I have entered a certain premises, a private premises in Berlin, and try to uh, damage the property. So I was quite uh, puzzled and I was not even a refugee at the time. I was uh, staying in Germany with a scholarship from the German pen. And when I checked the address of the letter that I got, I realized actually the address belongs to Sri Lankan embassy in Berlin. And the letter I got in June 2009, but the incident the letter refers to has happened in February 2009. So I had to inform the pen who were hosting me and tell them that I have got a letter from the police asking me to present myself uh, at the Berlin police headquarters. And fortunately, they got involved. And finally, actually, when we uh, double check, I mean, like the uh, uh, compare the dates, we realized actually on that particular day, exactly at that time, 
we were with the pen having dinner in some place in uh, Berlin. And as a result of it, the police, uh, uh, the lawyer got involved and he asked me not to come to the police and he will deal with it. And that was a false complaint made to the German police. That is even one month before the Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka was founded. So that is how the government is dealing with, even with the people who are actually think, we think that we are safe because are out of, this, out of the country. But if they really need to deal with this kind of uh, situation, they would do, they would go an extra mile to deal with people like uh, us, and it proves. Will you say that they, are they more worried qualitatively of journalists reporting about the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity, that they are about corruption, or they will just not like to be exposed in any way? Well, I think uh, the journalists who are reporting or collecting information on war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity that happened during the war, uh, they can't actually uh, expose any of those information using the Sri Lankan media, I mean, like the newspapers or the, any other electronic medias, because uh, that, is, that, exists, that topic exists beyond the limits of media freedom. And if they want to deal with that, it comes with a price, just like uh, it uh, happened to many others, like even La Santa. And if you uh, allow me, I would like to point out a couple of things about La Santa's killing, because La Santa's killing uh, has a direct connection to the government's war effort. Because La Santa exposed massive corruption behind uh, the much uh, celebrated uh, war victories that was being uh, part of the government's success at the time. And it had a direct connection. And before he was killed, everybody knows about La Santa's editorial that was, I mean, that was published posthumously uh, about when they, uh, then they came for me. But before that, he wrote an editorial which has not been highlighted enough. Actually, five days before he was killed, that was his last editorial he wrote while he was still living uh, and uh, working as the editor of the paper. And let me, let me, uh, quickly quote his words. This is what he wrote. Now, he exposed massive corruption, as I said, but a week before he was killed, coinciding with the capture of Tamil rebel-held administrative capital, Kilinochi, by the government forces, he wrote an editorial titled, A Nation's Last Hurrah. That was the only single editorial published in any of the Sinhala or English newspapers in that week, had courage to challenge the triumphalist narrative put forward by the government. And let me quote his own words. I'll quote two paragraphs. This is what he wrote. No one doubts that with an investment of nearly 200 billion Sri Lankan rupees per year and the willingness to exp expend a few thousand lives and limbs, the government can, in the course of 2009, credibly claim to have won not just Kilinochi, but all of the North. Now, he wrote this in 4th of January, 2009. The 200 billion rupees we plan to spend on bombing the life out of the LTT's remaining 4,000 carders, after all, should do the job. As for the lives, there are still plenty of space left on those stone tablets on the doormat of the parliament for them. And as for limbs, where would Jaipur be if not for the steady stream of feet shipped to help keep the armed forces on the, <coughs> on the hop? Granted that after winning the war, just as in, is the case in the east, the north too will be converted into an occupied territory. A matrix of army camps will dot the landscape, help to keep errant Tamils from getting any funny ideas, and the lion flags will flutter briskly in the Kachan winds of the Vanni. It will not be the meek but Douglas Devananda who will inherit the earth, who is a, a, a Sri Lankan politician and a, a paramilitary leader. The meek, after all, will be arranged in heat little rows in their respective refugee camps, eating their lunch from the tinsel packs dispensed by the World Food Program. And this was exactly a kind of visionary words which he saw, which is going to happen to the Tamils. And this is connected to his death, directly connected to his death, because this basically challenged euphoria that was prevailing at that moment. And therefore, La Santa's example clearly shows if you are going to deal with such issues, basically questions the state ability to commit crimes, 
state's willingness to commit crimes, then it always comes with a price. And that is the reason why most of the journalists, the colleagues we are, have, we are having on the ground, whenever they get kind of controversial information or evidence, they try to put it out. They try to push it out of the country because they know we can do it better than them because of the consequences are different for us compared to their, the consequences they will have to face. I would like to, another of the purpose of this tribunal, as you know well, is to analyze and, and very much bring to the record the impunity levels. You mentioned reprisal that was taken against you during your time in exile in, in Berlin. Is that, could you perhaps, and maybe it's, it's the work of the, of the Journalists for Democracy as well, recording a little bit that such impunity, they can be passive by not allowing anybody to seek or to obtain justice and truth, but also active by uh, taking legal actions for applying the terrorist charges and, and their like. Would you just give us a little bit of a sense of how that, that has happened or it keeps happening in Sri Lanka? Well, that is uh, exactly related to the answer that I uh, gave initially, because uh, we can't uh, discuss the crimes committed against media separated from the crimes committed against the Tamils and now the Muslims. And the reason is because these are state crimes and whichever the regime that is going to rule Sri Lanka, unless they radically break from this tradition of committing crimes, against their own citizens. This problem will remain. And if you take the example of the regime change that happened in 2015, and which lasted for four months, four years, uh, everybody started thinking that it is a kind of a progress, that we are making progress because now there are no killings. But I think the most strongest kind of uh, witness against that narrative is in this room with us is Sandhya. And the experience that Sandhya had during that government, giving the hope, giving her the hope that there will be justice uh, uh, delivered. And at the end of the day, she faced more risks and she had to send her children out because they were at risk at, 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 uh, more than uh, her actually. So what matters is actually the policy of total impunity is uh, a kind of, I mean, apart from the state criminality, the impunity is actually the elephant in the room. And as long as you don't deal with the past crimes, you don't need to commit new crimes because by leaving the crimes as it is and leaving the perpetrators free, they are giving a clear, they are sending a clear message to the others saying that we have like 44 number number 44 journalists and media workers who have been killed. If you want to cross the line, still it is like that. And no perpetrator has been basically uh, uh, brought to justice. And that sends a clear message to everyone who is thinking of writing something against or exposing something that deals with the state crimes. And impunity is what connects the government after government. Uh, one government commit crimes and the next government reward them with impunity. And when they commit crimes, their successor would reward them with impunity, which has been the case since the 50s and 60s. None of, the, we are talking about Sri Lanka, when it comes to mass uprisings and rebellions, we are talking about numbers like 15,000, 60,000, 100,000 people getting killed. But we haven't seen a single case where their state perpetrators were brought to justice they were brought to book and justice delivered to the victims. There had been no incident like that since 1970s at least. So we are living in a country where it seems like one of the oldest democracies in Asia, where there's a functioning democracy, functioning state, free media, multi-party system and all these things. But where also we have second largest number of, second highest number of disappearances in the world. And one of the most uh, largest, I mean, uh, uh, the numerically most number of uh, mass graves were find, found in Sri Lanka. So there's a obscene underbelly to the celebrated democracy in Sri Lanka. And that is created by the crimes of the state. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if you want to add anything from your prior statement. And if not, the, the, the panel of judges may have some questions. Uh, 
No, I will wait for the questions. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know, are there any significant organized crime groups in Sri Lanka? And is there any evidence of their involvement in any attacks on the journalists there or other state crimes? Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, some of the crimes that uh, that involves these 44 journalists were either carried out by directly by the state armed forces and at times by the paramilitaries, which are unofficially backed by the state. And uh, because I, I have a, sub, I mean, a submission to make, which I will hand it uh, over to the judges, which details, it, I mean, uh, the victims, all the details of the victims, along with the dates they were killed, where they were killed, and their photographs, uh, and they they include the journalists as well as media workers. And some of the, me I mean, most of these media workers were also killed simply because they have worked in the wrong newspaper or the wrong media outlet. And therefore, the organized, uh, the biggest organized criminal group or the criminal gang in the country is the state itself. And when they are not we are ready to do or carry out something in open, they would outsource it to certain groups that have been funded and backed by the state. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, but my hearing is not great. Um, and I didn't understand what you were saying right at the beginning about the 44, the 38, and the 35. Could you? Clarify that for me, please. Yeah, I will. Uh, so I just wanted 44. to. Yeah, it's. I said uh, the since April two thousand four, that was the time the United People's Freedom Alliance came to power, uh, from which the current uh, the previous president Mahinda Rajapaksha contested in the same year, but at the time April two thousand four he was the prime minister of the country. And uh, since 2004 April, uh, there had been 44 journalists up till the disappearance of Pragit Eknaligoda. 44 media workers and journalists have either been killed or disappeared, made to disappear. And out of these 44, at least 38 of them, the direct, I mean, the perpetrator is the state. And some of the journalists have been killed uh, by the rebel groups, and some of the journalists died in bomb explosions. And this 38, out of this 38, 35 remain Tamil. So there's a clear Tamil. ethnic dimension, the Tamil community, because there's a clear ethnic dimension to the crimes committed against media, which is actually connected to the crimes committed against the larger Tamil community. So killing Tamil journalists is part of committing crimes against the Tamil community. Okay, thanks, that's, that's amazing. Disturbing. Uh, thank um, you. Thank yeah, you. could I, could I, could I oh, just a ask you. another question re relating to the to the outsourcing of crime by the state? And you said that there are groups that are um, funded by by the state or employed by the state, direct directed or requested to kill or disappear. Are these actually, in some cases, organized criminal groups? Or are they, for example, as in the Philippines, uh, considered uh, vigilantes? Uh, not exactly. It's a the, it's a mode of operandi is completely different uh, when it comes to Sri Lanka, because these groups are uh, either directly uh, controlled by the state armed forces, or they are appear to be uh, ex I mean functioning. Uh, independently, but actually they are politically affiliated to the uh, to the government uh, government in right. power, and these groups actually these paramilitaries, which is known uh, mostly as paramilitaries, are yes. not like uh, like a gang of criminals like what you see in Philippines or many other countries, probably in uh, Mexico. Uh, yeah. But here it's actually they have been uh, paid by the government and they are working along with the government forces. Right. Yeah. They have that in the Philippines too. Yes, thank you. That's very clear now. Marina, did you have a question or not? 
Thank you. I have no further question. It has been very, very clear so far. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Jayavardhani, uh, yeah, sorry, Avivardhani. Um, thank you for giving that larger picture and connecting uh, the issue of you know what's happening in Sri Lankan society to the specifics of the murders of journalists. So my question to you is this, that you said that the self-censorship is by the journalists and not because of the structure of the media. So I want to understand this because pre the Tamil war, even during Siri Mabo's time, the mainstream tam uh, press, Sinhala press particularly, was never very critical of the government in power, from my understanding. And uh, that seemed to continue, you know. And it's only in the later part when you had some independent television stations that came up, as well as the opening of the internet, that the spaces were created for dissent. So my question to you is, why do you say that it's the journalists themselves? Wasn't it because they were associated with media houses that chose to keep the government happy because they knew what the consequences were, were even before the Tamil Elam uh, yeah. struggle? Yeah. Uh, there are two, two, actually, there are two aspects to this uh, uh, question. Because one thing is actually, in Sri Lanka, the ownership of media is deeply connected to the pol uh, the pol uh, people who are in power. So there are family connections, there are business connections as anywhere in the world, and uh, there are political connections as well. Because some of them are actually, while running the paper, they are part of, they are playing a big part in the ruling parties or uh, the organizations affiliated to ruling parties. But uh, having said that, now they, of course, they determine the content of the newspapers. But uh, there's also a lack of uh, willingness uh, on the side of the journalist. I'm not talking about all the journalists in the country. There are quite a lot of journalists in the South as well as all the journalists, I would say, in the North and East who are coming from the Tamil, Tamil journalists, who are paying the, the biggest price, actually. Uh, and Tamils don't, uh, Tamil journalists, actually, Tamil media workers, basically, uh, they don't care the, about the consequences because they have seen the worst. So they will always uh, cross the line and they will expose what they are going through because it's, it's, the, it's a matter of their existence. But when it's come to the journalists who are working in the South, it's a matter of choice. Whether you want to expose something that actually goes against the ideological beliefs that you are holding, which connects you to the state. And that connection is basically determined on the racial lines. And the journalists, the way they report on the crimes that are committed by the state is whether we committed the crimes against the Tamils or not, not the state committed the crimes. So they always try to, because the denial is what makes us a nation. We commit crimes when it comes to victims, when the victims are Tamils or Muslims, we make an alliance with each other, the politicians, with the journalists, and journalists with the media owners, and with the writers, and intellectuals, and everyone. We, have, we are basically making an alliance uh, to constitute, I mean, like basically to express ourselves, collective self, as a nation. And when the Tamil Tigers were there, our existence uh, and our collective identity was determined as opposed to Tamil Tigers. So we are a nation because we have been threatened by the existence of the Tamil Tigers. And once the Tamil Tigers were taken off the equation, then there was a problem, a dilemma. How are you going to, I mean, basically express your collective self? And then the denial helped us to collect, I mean, uh, express ourselves as a nation. And denial is what even now makes us a nation because we say we, people's I mean, world, I mean, countries in the world accuse us for committing crimes which we didn't, which we haven't committed. And those who basically agree with that uh, kind of denial makes part of the nation. And the journalists are part of it. And very few journalists who have the guts and the courage to challenge that narrative and to write something which goes against this denial. And to say that no, the state has committed basically crimes and we basically turn a blind eye when the crimes are committed. And very few journalists are still there who are trying to do this job in the South, but a majority of journalists are also are actually part of this ideological alliance, which makes them close to the state. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your important testimony. And 
could you give us your opinion um, on the role played by the judiciary um, on the level of judicial uh, protection and reaction against crimes, violence, and threat to journalists? Thank well, you. unfortunately, the judiciary has not played any positive role when it comes to crimes, not only again, uh, about the crimes against journalists, but the crimes by the state. And uh, I can give you one example. Uh, a colleague, a journalist colleague of mine, uh, Mr. J. S. T. Sanayagam, who was a very senior journalist who used to work for two decades in the country as a journalist, at least over two decades, I would say. And in 2008, March, he was arrested. And he was arrested when he went to visit his publisher, who was arrested the previous day by the Terrorist Investigation Division. And when he went to inquire about his uh, well-being, he was arrested. And then they charged him for writing two articles. Initially, he, they charged him for being part of the Tamil rebel outfit, the LTTE. And when there was no evidence to prove that can be used against him, they kept changing the accusations. And finally, he was charged for writing two articles, which he wrote in 2008 and 2007, actually. Uh, about the massive displacement happening in the eastern part of the country. And these two articles was basically dealing with the refugee crisis, refugees generated by the war effort. And it has nothing to do with uh, inciting violence against uh, other communities. But he was, uh, he was basically accused for this crime. And what happened was there was a court case, which is a sham court case, I would say. And as a result of the court case, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, rigorous imprisonment, for writing two articles. And finally, because there was a huge campaign, uh, especially international campaign, which had a huge impact, he was released. And judiciary, knowing well the whole uh, problem and the, especially the treatment, that they, the, 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 the way they were treated inside the terrorist investigation division, they turned a blind eye and they went with the, the state narrative because they were given a job and they wanted to do the job. Only now, after a very long time, now we are seeing small changes, but that is also uh, when the Sinhala protesters uh, are being targeted in the last month. The Sri Lanka Bar Association has made interventions. And I hope they would intervene in the same manner to the uh, uh, intimidation and the harassment uh, the Tamils are facing and the Muslims are facing in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. I would like to go back to something that you already mentioned, and I'm sorry, uh, but I, I would like to highlight some of the points that probably you already, you already underscore. Uh, the prosecutor asked you about self-censorship. And one of my colleagues also asked something similar, and you start talking about brave journalists that are still reporting or something like that. My question is regarding the point of view of the people in Sri Lanka. Is there any possibility today to receive fair information? Is there still, you mentioned brave journalists that are reporting, or the situation is that bad that it's almost impossible to receive information, uh, fair information uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, if you refer to the current situation, if you're referring to the current situation, uh, the biggest problem is actually uh, in Sri Lanka now there's, it's, it has become impossible to publish newspapers because uh, there's no paper and uh, the newspapers uh, are not being published regularly now. And even if they're publishing the papers, big companies, of course, uh, the number of pages are quite limited because of the paper shortage. And when it comes to electronic media, the electronic media is generally run by groups and companies either close to government or any of the uh, official uh, op op parliamentary opposition. And therefore, I mean, the, the cracks from which the information flows out is created by the political kind of contradictions between the uh, 
media outlets which have been backed by other parties and the state policies. And not because they have taken a principal stand of the, their duty as, as a duty to expose and to uh, inform the people about the truth. It's not because of that. And it's mainly the cracks are generated by the political contradictions so the political opposition between parties and that opposition has been reflected in media as well. So the media space, basically media landscape, is not, uh, there's no such thing uh, called uh, principal position of bringing information to the people, even though this has been repeatedly said by all the media. It's a very few alternative uh, couple of newspapers were there who were trying to expose all these things. But the problem is now they are fighting to survive because of the difficulties at the moment. Gil, yes, can you come in from Australia? Yes, um, I wanted to um, add a few things to, to what you said about the judiciary. Um, even when uh, a, a person is high up uh, in, in the military as General Fonseca, he could be uh, facing trumped up charges and, and tossed into, into the prison for three years. In fact, uh, they gave him an extra three years. But that whole thing is, is quite fascinating. Um, the way anybody who challenged, I, I believe he said that, that there were possibly some war crimes and they should be investigated. So he was someone who was challenging the state narrative. Um, and he had also lost the election uh, to uh, uh, Mahinda uh, Rajapaksa. Uh, so they really dealt with him. But in turn, um, when uh, Sirisena became president, um, he, he rehabilitated Fonseca entirely and brought him back into the, into the government. So that's one case. Um, the second case, which I don't know much about, which you may or may not wish to comment on, um, involved the Hambantota um, scam that uh, Mahinda uh, was, was involved in. And he was cleared and, uh, of, of corruption. Um, and as I say, I don't know the details, but the chief justice is said to have cleared him. And later, and this often happens, you know, later when it doesn't matter, uh, he apologized to the country and said it was the biggest mistake of his life. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, which you may want to uh, elaborate, it, it's very interesting to me as, as a law professor, etc., um, and someone who's researched these issues in, in, in the Philippines, um, the attorney, attorneys general uh, under most of these regimes seem to have really dragged their feet uh, and blocked investigations or not allowed them uh, to prosper in any way. But on the other hand, uh, and this is something I don't quite understand because it seems to me unusual and contradictory. Um, it does seem that a number of the organizations, um, the FCID, the CID, and some others, do seem to have carried out investigations and uh, hoped to be able to, uh, uh, or, or, or indeed did, did, did uh, bring charges and, and presumably hoped for some, some positive result from their hard work. Um, can you talk a little bit about about uh, attorneys general and and particularly the the um, the lack of success that these organizations had, even though they appear to have tried to do something? Well, uh, I will start from the uh, Hambantota scam. What uh, the chief justice said, because what the chief justice said at the moment at, at that I mean after he retired from his position. During opposition, I mean, political rally of the opposition parties, he said the biggest mistake in his life was to set Mahindra Rajapaksha free, even after knowing that he was involved in that scam. Basically, it's about collecting funds for the tsunami victims and taking money yeah. from that. And Shocking. then 
what happened was after that in the next election he became again he uh, climbed up to the platforms the same platform that he said the person who uh, committed this uh, kind of scam and uh, he supported mahindra rajapaksa in the next election campaign so this per- i mean you can't i mean basically there's no principal position he made this uh, statement while he was supporting the opposition and then retracted it when he decided to support again the same person that he accused of uh, committing i mean basically uh, involving corruption and when it uh, the question about attorney general's department and the attorney general at least in my lifetime i have never seen an independent kind of uh, uh, role played by the attorney, uh, attorney general and basically whoever had been in the position basically what they are supposed to do is to clear the government from responsibility of various mm-hmm. crimes the government committed and also go after the people who are actually challenging the government and try to uh, 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 prosecute them for something completely fabricated charges and this has been the role and the job of the attorney general's department from a long since whichever the government comes into power this has been the role so it's a matter of changing positions and changing people but uh, the role of the attorney general department is basically to clear the government uh, in power from all the crimes that they have committed and and could you say something about the investigative institutions uh, that i that i mentioned and to what extent they they actually did and do try uh, sorry uh, can you uh, refer to the organization i can't remember exactly yeah yeah sorry? yeah okay yeah, cid and yeah this was actually yeah. this all these uh, bodies comes into existence when a new government come to power and in the course of the time normally they start abandoning the cases and whether the officers involved are uh, really uh, interested in carrying out the investigations or not is a matter that is completely unrelated to the decisions that is government going to take on the victim, on the uh, the perpetrators or the people who are involved in those uh, corruption kind of scandals and the best example i mean uh, was actually the case of pragit technaligoda now the state uh basically it appeared to be like the criminal investigative department was after going after the real culprits and they arrested couple of uh, uh, people who are actually uh, who are actually members of the uh, state armed forces who are from the intelligence wing and so initially there was high hopes about uh, that the justice will be delivered and within the next 3 years gradually one by one they came out from prison and they were reinstated Uh, in the same position and that uh, created more risk uh, for per- people like sandhya because uh, more than uh, uh, the the risk that they had already faced during the previous governments so it it it, it also i mean has a clear connection to the cid's uh, kind of investigations there had been huge information i mean been gathered accumulated against certain people and at the end of the day nobody knows what happened to this in uh, information and finally all these people went to uh, courts and they were uh, absolved from all the charges so there's mm-hmm. a kind of division of labor between all these investigative bodies the judiciary and the polit- uh, the the parliament and the executive so this division of labor is what determines the outcome of the investigations uh, thank you uh, i want to know if there are some patterns uh, to silence journalists if they receive death threats before or surveillance uh, warnings or torture jail i don't know or direct they go and kill them or disappear also how many how many are disappear like if how it operates and if there is a difference in these patterns between journalists in north and south also if if there is a difference in the behavior uh, or roles with where there are committed by militaries police paramilitaries or whoever do it well uh, i think uh, about the numbers and uh, the the numbers how many have been killed and how many have been disappeared uh, as i'm hoping to submit this document uh, it's all detailed in this i mean all the details have been given in this document so you can uh, have a look at it and see how many have been abducted and made to disappear and how many have been uh, assassinated 
and the thing is actually uh, also the ethnic dimension of the killings can be easily seen uh, seen by the i mean from the details you can easily uh, see the details uh, but apart from that actually the thing is uh, getting a formal warning is a luxury in a country like sri lanka because nobody get that kind of warnings and mm. from what i remember only in the case of this uh, the person i mentioned earlier uh, js tisanayagam the journalist who was uh, sentenced to 20 years rigorous imprisonment now he is the only journalist who uh, and there were actually one or two others who were uh, who was sent to jail but most of the journalists were didn't receive i mean the thing is actually when you live and work in a country like sri lanka your instinct guides you and the journalists work just following their in- instinct and when the instinct says that you are in real danger without receiving any kind of formal threat you react to that instinct actually that is how it has been all the time and if there had been a formal way of letting journalists know that you have been targeted and you will be dealt with many of the journalists would have survived many of the journalists would have been I mean, would have survived because they would have reacted and planned their work according to the risks that they are facing but the thing what happens is they always come for you they always come for you and they uh, there's no kind of stages of the threats you write something and you get killed and that's the pattern of the uh, state uh, perpetrated crimes against journalists and there's no other pattern there's no other formal warning sending letters calling uh, sending i mean there had been instances for example a person like lasanta has been receiving such calls for a very long time but the thing is when you get used to that kind of threatening calls it becomes part of your profession and you don't take this call is more dangerous than the previous call that you get so as a result of it there's always a tipping point at a certain point they decide to get rid of that person which has happened to lasanta i don't know if there are some survivors of torture or this or all the people who survived they are on exile exiled or there are survivors actually there are survivors who were abducted tortured and then survived uh, like for example in 2009 uh, the secretary of uh, working journalists association of sri lanka who briefly went into exile hoping that he would you know he would hoping to stay outside for a while and then go back to sri lanka which he did and was abducted and then tortured and he i mean he basically he was uh, almost almost uh, pushed to his death i mean everybody was i mean, expected that he might get killed when the news came that he was abducted but fortunately he survived and then he had to leave the country and there are others as well quite a lot of journalists who were abducted and for various reasons they survived just by chance they survived and many of them had to leave the country only very few as far as i know who remain inside the country but also if they decide to remain inside the country they have decided to change the way they work so they have never been in, uh, critical in the same way uh that they used to be earlier after such abduction or torture thank you thank you uh, ashana i have uh two questions one is um the editorial that lasanto wrote um as you said five days i think before he was killed um is it possible for you to pr- provide that to us yes um because i think we've all seen yes. the editorial posthumously yeah. but uh, i i haven't seen this earlier one um in fact your whole testimony is is full of information that we need to uh, go through um my second question relates to the current situation and whether you see any um break in the uh pattern of uh of sinhala um dismissal of the of the tamil issue uh within the within the current protesters is this uh beginning to change any sensitivity coming forward we are, are told uh that there is a an interethnic and interclass or cross class uh, representation in the in the demonstrations uh but i'd like to hear a little bit more about yeah. whether uh this sensitivity to the tamil question uh coming forward and also the extent of uh of participation by Tamils uh, 
in the, in the protests? Well, unfortunately, my answer is uh, uh, such kind of deep understanding about the Tamil issue, or even the issues of Muslims, is not part of the ongoing campaign. The ongoing protest campaign is basically the dominant kind of uh, thinking in that campaign is uh, determined by the economic difficulties the people are facing. And the criticism that has been leveled against Rajapaksha by the protesters uh, is basically uh, determined by highlighting the Rajapaksha the thief, not the Rajapaksha the murderer. So the criminality aspect of Rajapaksha's rule has been left out because there's a certain feeling that if you bring that out, that would benefit the Tamils or even the Muslims. So there's a, I mean, if you look at the pattern of the whole pro, I mean, this is, I'm saying, while admiring the kind of courage shown by the young protesters who have actually tried to break this. And it's a very, I mean, isolated cases where people uh, came onto streets with all the other placards and slogans they used to have certain slogans which basically highlighted the criminality aspect of the state to say, this is what you did to the Tamils and now you are going to do it to us. And this is very, this is not a, com a very uh, 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 common thing that you could see in, uh, among the protesters, but quite isolated. And they are doing it at uh, taking great risks actually in the South. And the other thing is actually, when you look at the whole protest campaigns, the level of Tamil involvement in the campaign uh, from the North and East is very limited, not because that they don't hold the same kind of position when it comes to the state, but they have more grievances and they have more complaints to make, which is not accommodated by the larger protest, because if they come onto streets and say, this state committed war crimes against us, this state committed a genocide against the Tamil people, I don't know how many protesters would stand with such a slogan. Because that is why I said the connection they have with the state and now what we can see, there's a connection which always the protester is connected to the state through their loyalty to the military. Because they are, they, I mean, they basically, they uh, despise Rajapaksha's and they had confrontations with the special task force of the police and the police uh, themselves, but not with the military. And that is one of the reasons I believe that the state is not deploying military until recently onto the streets to confront the protesters. Because if you put this military on the ground, and that would create a situation where the protesters will be compelled to confront the military. And if they confront the military, there will be consequences, and that consequences will determine how the people perceive the role of the military and their connection to the state, which is for the moment, you can't see actually. So I think the state has, I mean, they are working in a calculated manner, in my opinion, they are analyzing and they are basically observing and analyzing the pattern of the protest and which classes are involved, which ethnic groups are involved, which political parties are involved, and then getting the feedback from the intelligence, uh, members of the intelligence wing who have been deployed among the protesters to understand the internal dynamics of the protest. And one of the uh, major dynamics they must have seen is still there's a certain loyalty of these protesters to the state military, because from the slogans and the way they deal with the military, uh, it has been uh, reflected. And that the government, I think, does not want to uh, spoil. For the moment, at least, we see that kind of, uh, I mean, like uh, great patience has been maintained on the side of the military, because if they lose the connection the protesters have with the military, and that ends the last thread that the protest uh, existing, which connects the protesters to the state. And that is why until one month, the military was not deployed on the streets until two days or three days ago when the military started rolling in. But that is also after the streets were cleared. So, so that, that problem is actually there. And the reason the Tamils cannot become a kind of uh, enthusiastic supporters or kind of part of the protest is because you come to a protest if you are being given an opportunity to voice your issues. And the Tamils are, I mean, Tamils have great issues like war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, which will not, any of, this, any of those issues will not be accommodated into the ongoing protest campaign because it basically uh, challenges 
the official narrative was the war victory and uh, the ending of terrorism, which is quite a, I mean, if that happens, that would be a historic moment of the history of uh, Sri Lanka. If the panel allows me, I have one question to finalize. Uh, and it's just to elaborate a little bit on the aspect of impunity, which I think is very important for this, uh, for this tribunal. We understand that, that perhaps, or I shouldn't you know, just uh, presume, but the, the connections between the police and the military with the executive and the people in government. And I know you hinted to questions of the panel, but where are the judges in all of this? Are they completely complicit? with uh, what's happening or was dictated from the executive? There's any dissidents within? Where, where are the, the, what is the judiciary in, in that universe? Well, we have seen rarely what you can call as dissidents, actually. Uh, any kind of dissidents we have seen quite rarely. And generally, the judiciary is a part of the problem. They have been always part of the problem. And the judges themselves, I mean, the getting been promoted to become a judge is also decided by the president himself. And uh, uh, am I answer answering the question? Correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so the thing is actually uh, appointments. I mean, may, uh, it is up to the president to appoint the judges, basically, because there had been changes made during the past couple of years, like 19th Amendment. Uh, but that has been reversed after this government came to power. And uh, so the independent judiciary is a uh, it's a history, actually, in Sri Lanka. It's past. And uh, only in the last one month's time, we have seen a relative independence in the way the judiciary is making, the judges are making judgments, and also the role of the lawyers, uh, which we haven't seen for a very, very long time. And if that, uh, it's going, I mean, that tradition is going to survive, that would be good for the country. But I don't know how long that would uh, be the case, and I'm not uh, sure about that. Thank you very much. Yes, from Gil. Yeah. Um, in the Philippines, the lawyers have been uh, killed uh, 70 in six years under Duterte. I was wondering about the, the lawyers, including prosecutors, judges, and attorneys or advocates. Have they also been killed, or has it not been necessary since they are incorporated? Or are there differences between the judges and the, the advocates and prosecutors? Well, again, the question depends on uh, which lawyers we are talking about. Because as, lawyers, as long as the lawyers are Tamil and who have been representing the interests of the victims of the, uh, victims of, uh, the terror laws, the counter-terror laws, uh, they are facing risk. They have been facing risk for a very long time. But when it comes to the uh, single lawyers, there hadn't been, in the recent past, there hadn't been any such incidents which involves, uh, basically which has created risk for uh, lawyers in the South. Very few, very few, I would say. Uh, but in the 80s, of course, in the late 80s, quite a lot of lawyers were killed. Because at the time, the victims were Sinhalese, and there were so many lawyers who represented the victims. But uh, after 1990, there hadn't been any such incident, which uh, involves killing of lawyers or killing of judges or forcing them into exile. OK, then I think we're done. Thank you again very much for Can being I make part of Absolutely, yeah. please. Uh, I just uh, request your permission to read out the names of this journalist, just the names, because I think their names should be heard, because they are, these are just uh, not names, but they were killed because they were doing their job properly. And uh, since 2004, but there are more journalists who were killed before 2004. And I'm just uh, limiting, I mean, limiting to 2004 to 2010 because uh, the document basically deals with the crimes committed by the uh, current uh, rulers, actually. Uh, 2004. Ayyaturi Nadesan from Batikalo, Kandasami Ayyar Bala, uh, Nadaraja from Colombo, uh, Lanka Jayasundara, a journalist from Colombo, Dharmaratnam Sivaram, killed in Colombo, Kannamuttu Arasakumar, 
a media worker from Mathupola, Kalmuni, Relangi Selvaraja, a journalist from Colombo, David Selvaratnam, a media worker from Colombo, Yogakumar Krishna Pillai, a media worker from Batikalo, L.M. Falil, a writer from Batikalo, K. Navaratnam, a media worker from Jaffna, Subramanian Suhirtarajan, a journalist from Trincomali, S.T. Gananadan, the patron of the Tamil News and Information Centre from Jaffna, Bastian George Satyadas, a Sagedas, media worker from Jaffna, Rajaratnam Ranjit Kumar, media worker from Jaffna, Sampar Lakmal de Silva, a journalist from Colombo, Maria Dasan Manojan, Manojan Raj, a media worker from Jaffna, Satasivam Baskaran, a media worker from Jaffna, Sinatambi Siva Maharaja, media owner from Jaffna, S. Ravindran, media worker from Jaffna, Subramaniam Ramachandran, a journalist from Jaffna, Chandrabo Sudhakar, a journalist from Vaunia, Selaraja Rajivarman, journalist from Jaffna, Sahadevan Nilakshan, a journalist from Jaffna, Antoni Pille Sherin uh, Sitiranjan, media worker from Jaffna, Vadivelu Nimalaraj, media worker from Jaffna, Isavili Champion, journalist from Kilinochi, Suresh Limbio, media worker from Kilinochi, T. Dharmalingam, media worker from Kilinochi, W. Gunasinghe, a journalist from uh, Kabiti Golaya, Central, North Central Province, Paran Rupasingham Devakumar, journalist from Jaffna, Mohammad Rasmi Maharuf, journalist from Anuradhapur, Rasaya Jayendiran, journalist from Mulativ, Lasanta Vikramatunga, journalist from Colombo, Punyamurti Satyamurti, journalist from Mulativ, Sasi Madan, media worker from Mulativ, Nalaya Maheswaran, media worker from Mulativ, Maria Nayaga Manton Benedict, and his whole family was killed in this incident. And there's no one we could even get a photograph of him from Mulativ. Rajkumar Mary Densi, media worker from Mulativ. Jairaja Susidara Sugandan, media worker from Mulativ. Arulappan Antoni Kumar, media worker from Mulativ. Thuraisingham Tarshan, media worker from Mulativ. Isai Priya, also known as Shobana Dharmaraja, a media a journalist from Mulativ. Tirukul Singhan Thawbalan, journalist and political actress from Mulativ. Pragit Teknaligoda, journalist from Colombo. And these are all, not just names, but everyone involves, I mean, everyone mentioned in this list as a family, people who are looking for justice, who have not been delivered, given justice. And we are here, I mean, as, as journalists for democracy in Sri Lanka, I am here to emphasize the need for justice, because this is what we lack for decades. And I come from a generation which went through a massacre uh, where 60,000 got killed and we didn't get justice. And Tamil people have been living through genocidal policies, getting killed on a daily basis until 2009. And then this genocidal process continues, but there's no justice. And the Muslim people who have been targeted routinely by the racist thugs uh, sponsored by the governments and uh, state, and now languishing in prisons under uh, draconian laws like Prevention of Terrorism Act in hundreds, they have not got justice. And what shape our lives in Sri Lanka is actually not the way we live, the way my people in the country live, but the way people died. And to change that, we need justice. And that is all that, I mean, we have been talking about democracy, we are talking about quite a lot of things, but justice has been missing, which connects one decade to another and that decade to a next decade is not traditions of uh, fraternity, traditions of uh, solidarity, but what connects all these decades is actually the crimes that were committed and the terror that we have witnessed from the state. And the legacy of Sri Lanka is a legacy of terror, a legacy of unspeakable crimes. And all these crimes need, people who survive these crimes need justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.